Good evening, Your Excellency, Mr. Teo Chihyan, Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security of Singapore, Professor Wang Gungwu, Chairman, ICS Board of Trustees, Honorable Director of ICS, Mr. Choi Shin Kwok, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by congratulating the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies on its golden anniversary and by thanking the director of the Institute for inviting me to deliver the Singapore lecture. I particularly appreciate the opportunity to speak here today on the challenges and objectives of our democratic transition as Singapore is the chair of ASEAN this year. Our ASEAN friends have been generous with necessary help and support as we negotiate the passage of an intricate transition. They have demonstrated the value of regional solidarity based on shared experiences and aspirations. The premise that what helps one part helps the whole underpins a consensual cooperative approach that has played a vital part in making ASEAN one of the most successful regional organizations in the world, despite development gaps between its member states. A transition, to put it simply, is the process of going across from one point to another. The distance that must be covered and the nature of the terrain that must be traveled define the scope and complexity of the challenges that have to be faced and overcome. Myanmar is crossing over from a long-established authoritarian system to one that we label democracy. Our people's perception, or rather perceptions of democracy, varied, incoherent, and inconsistent as they may be, impact on the transition that our country is undergoing today. During the last three quarters of a century, Myanmar has undergone three major transitions from colonial rule to independence in 1948, from parliamentary democracy to military dictatorship in 1962, and still in progress today, since 1988, still incomplete is the transition from dictatorship to democracy. The first transition was a straightforward culmination of a hard and costly struggle, a clean-cut change from the status of colonial subject country to that of a sovereign independent nation. The second transition too was sharp and clearly placed in time. Tanks on the streets of the capital one morning, a crisp declaration on the radio. Our present transition is the most complex, the most challenging of all. The very beginning was amorphous. There was nothing so definite as the lowering of one flag and the raising of another no brief staccato announcement to mark the completion of one phase and the beginning of another in the life of our country. Several incidents, each in itself seemingly at the time of minor importance, fused together to become the force that launched a nationwide uprising for democracy. The uprising was put down quickly, but nevertheless, it opened the gates to the rocky Protean transit path that we continue to trade today. Democracy in 1988 meant for our people the opposite of all that they had associated with the Burmese way to socialism. A passion to slough off the oppressiveness of a one-party system with, with undertones of military despotism seized the whole country. The people cried out for an end to declining standards, to drabness, to the erosion of individual freedom. In response, direct military rule was speedily instituted and individual freedom further curtailed, but political parties were allowed to sprout, although their activities were severely curtailed, and faltering steps were taken towards an open market economy. From such an unpromising beginning, and after many obstacles and setbacks, including a general election in 1990 that found a brief flickering of hope, we reached the landmark elections of 2015. The National League of Democracy managed to win a majority large enough for us to form a government within the constraints of the Constitution adopted through a questionable referendum in 2008. When I speak of our democratic transition, I mean a democratic way towards a democratic goal, 
following a path laid down in accordance with the wishes of the people and maintained with their consent and cooperation. Our people yearn for peace and security, for an end to unrest and strife, for material and emotional security, for a chance to contemplate the future of their children with tranquility. It was from a desire to see these wishes fulfilled that they accepted the principles of nonviolence and national reconciliation on which the NLD was founded in 1988, and nearly three decades on, voted for the goals set by our party, rule of law, peace, development, amendments to the Constitution. The degree of progress of our transition has to be measured by the extent to which we are able, together with our people, to realize our aspirations. The Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan, which could also be seen as a roadmap for our transition, identifies five goals supported by three pillars. Goal one is peace, national reconciliation, security, and good governance. And goal two is economic stability and strengthened macroeconomic management. These rest on the pillar of peace and security. Goal three is job creation and private sector-led growth held up by the pillar of prosperity and partnership. The third pillar, people and planet, supports goal four, human resources and social development for 21st century society, and goal five, natural resources and the environment for prosperity of the nation. Goals one and two are independent and impossible to sustain without a solid pillar of peace and security and stability. Building this pillar we saw as the first task we had to address as we embarked on the path of transition. At the very commencement of our new administration on 30th March 2016, we took steps to implement our plans for taking forward the peace process that had been initiated by the previous government. The 21st century Panglong Conference seeks to put an end to the armed strife that, had ravaged, that has ravaged Myanmar since its birth as an independent nation and to construct a strong democratic federal union founded on a lasting unity created out of diversity. We had learned from the experiences of other countries that the path of peace processes seldom runs smooth and unimpeded. As ours was an unparalleled intricacy involving more than the common number of players, we were prepared for difficulties and disappointments, setbacks and even breakdowns. But we were determined to persevere because without peace, our transition could not blossom and bear fruit. There have been difficulties and disappointments as anticipated, but incessant negotiations, endless patience, the goodwill of participants, and the encouragement and help of our people and our friends have enabled us to keep moving forward. In each of the three Panglong meetings held over the last two years, we made valuable progress. In the first Union Peace Conference, a seven-step roadmap for peace and for peace, and, for peace and national reconciliation was achieved. In the second conference, 37 principles were adopted. Before the third conference, two more ethnic armed groups signed the ceasefire agreement, and during the conference itself, 14 more principles were adopted. Serious challenges remain, and armed conflicts continue to break out between the Tamado and the EAOs, as well as between the EAOs themselves. We are constantly alert to the challenges, and we aim to resolve them through dialogue and negotiation by persevering in the endeavor to build mutual trust and understanding. A sound base for peace and stability has to be broad and comprehensive. Addressing destabilizing issues in Rakhine State was a fundamental part of building our Pillar 1. Within two months of taking on the responsibilities of government, we established the Central Committee for Rule of Law and Development, development in Rakhine, and soon after, we approached Dr. Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the United Nations, 
to head an advisory commission that would help us to find lasting solutions to the problems that were jeopardizing peace and progress in a region so bountifully blessed by nature. Please allow me at this point to pay tribute to Dr. Kofi Annan. His qualities and achievements were myriad, but here it is only fitting that I should focus on what he meant to us as we negotiated the, peace, the path of democratic transition. He agreed to take on the responsibility of advising us on how we might resolve deep-rooted problems in the Rakhine because his nature was cast in a generous, positive mold. He wanted us to succeed, to reach our goals of peace, prosperity, security, and progress for our country. Dr. Anand abided by his decision to help us, even after events in Rakhine brought down severe criticism on Myanmar. His compassion, his integrity, and his courage shone through his acts and the recommend recommendations of his commission reflected his wisdom and his wide experience of the challenges of our times. His approach was constructive and caring. Despite the many demands on his duties, he made time to speak to me on the telephone occasionally, to ask how he might help, to listen, to encourage. One of the last public events he organized was a workshop earlier this year on lessons learned in Rakhine. His life is a lesson we could all learn to our profit. It exemplified the principles and values on which the United Nations was founded, the principles and values that allowed us to hope peace and prosperity might be possible for all in our world. The recommendations of Dr. Kofi Annan's commission, 88 in all, of which we have to date implemented 81, aim at the establishment of lasting peace and stability in Rakhine. But the challenges there are multifaceted and require multitasking. Resettlement of displaced persons now in Bangladesh has to be affected through the implementation of the agreement signed between Myanmar and Bangladesh last November. The government of Myanmar has also signed with the UNDP and the UNHCR an MOU that aims at assisting speedy and efficient resettlement and rehabilitation. We have already mapped out potential sites for the resettlement of returnees. UN officials have been granted access to 23 villages in 13 village tracts selected as part of a pilot assessment program, and an additional five villages have also been marked out for the resettlement of IDPs residing near the borderline. Involved at various fronts and levels is the Union Enterprise for Humanitarian Assistance, Resettlement and Development in Rakhine. It is an enterprise that brings together peoples and organizations from all parts of the country to work with the government to bring Rakhine into the orbit of our national plan for sustained development. The advisory board for the implementation of the recommendations of Dr. Anand's commission, chaired by Dr. Surakia Satiratai, former Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand, submitted its final report last week. I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the members of the board for a balanced and viable report. On their recommendation, an independent commission of inquiry led by Ambassador Rosario Manalu, an eminent diplomat from ASEAN, has been established. The Commission met for the first time in Ipidor on 15th August and will be commencing their work next week. We share deep sympathy and concern for all displaced persons, especially women and children. There are around 4 million Myanmar migrant workers and displaced persons at present in Thailand. Our two countries have succeeded in working together to resolve the issue amicably in the spirit of good neighborliness. Today, the majority of our, speakers, of our workers have been legally registered, and both employers and employees have benefited from the improved arrangements. The return of displaced persons to our country is also working smoothly as a result of close consultation and cooperation between Myanmar and Thailand. Similarly, we hope to work with Bangladesh to affect the voluntary, safe, and dignified return of displaced persons from northern Rakhine. 
We have reached out to Bangladesh by sending ministerial delegations to Dhaka, and last week, the Bangladeshi foreign minister was invited to Myanmar to see at first hand preparations we have made for the resettlement of returnees. During his visit, both sides agreed into alia to deliver on commitments made to speak, speed up implementations of bilateral agreements on repatriation and to set up a hotline between the two countries at the ministerial level. We also recognize the crucial role of the United Nations in addressing an issue of this nature. We facilitated the visits of the permanent representatives of the UN Security Council members, together with representatives of neighboring countries and the ASEAN chair, Singapore. We welcome the appointment of Ambassador Christine Bergener as Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General. She has already opened her office in Epidor. We believed that our engagement with Ambassador Bergener will be positive and fruitful. The danger of terrorist activities, which was the initial cause, a cause of events leading to the humanitarian crisis in Rakhine, remains real and present today. Unless this security challenge is addressed, the risk of intercommunal violence will remain. It is a threat that could have grave consequences, not just for Myanmar, but also for other countries in our region and beyond. Terrorism should not be condoned in any form for any reason whatsoever. We thank all our friends near and far who are helping us in different ways to resolve the challenges in Rakhine and thus helping our nascent transition to succeed. At this critical time, members of ASEAN and other friends can play a role by helping Myanmar in the implementation of Dr. Anand's recommendations in such areas as strengthening rule of law and strengthening educational and health infrastructure to help promote social harmony, social harmony and peaceful coexistence. We who are living through the transition in Myanmar view it differently from those who observe it from the outside and who will remain untouched by its outcome. For us, it is the broad, all-encompassing map of the future of our country, as well as the small details of our everyday life. Our approach has to be holistic and inclusive. We necessarily have to prioritize, but we cannot afford to neglect even low-priority issues. The outside world can choose the issues on which they wish to focus, and after Rakhine, that one, the one that is attracting most interest today is foreign direct investment. We place high importance on investment, but within the context of our wider needs. We want Myanmar to be business friendly, an environment where investors can be comfortable and secure, and where their interests can merge harmoniously with our development aims. Our new investment in company laws have been carefully crafted to promote best business practices as well as good governance. Procedures have been streamlined to remove bottlenecks and accelerate the implementation process. The new chair of the Myanmar Investment Commission is here with us today, and he is ready to assure those who are interested that he is willing and able to facilitate with business ventures. I should not usurp his prerogatives, but however, there are certain things he would like me to tell you. As an economic integration, coupled with, the, with innovation, free trade, people-to-people -people contacts, and regional connectivity, presents us with immense opportunities. Myanmar's recent economic surge is attributable to trade and investments from ASEAN and other East Asian economies. Myanmar and Singapore, strategically located at the crossroads of this economically vibrant region, have a pivotal role to play in ensuring the continued economic growth and prosperity of ASEAN countries. We can combine our comparative advantages, advantages to our mutual benefit and to the benefit of this region. Myanmar is the largest country on mainland Southeast Asia and is endowed with both arable land and natural resources, from forest products and minerals to natural gas. It also has a sizable population and a youthful workforce. Singapore, on the other hand, is one of the world's most reputable financial and trading centers, as well as a transportation hub. 
It is well equipped with world-class infrastructure that includes sea and air links and telecommunications. It is not only located in the heart of one of the fastest growing regions in the world, it has a skilled workforce and technical know-how that makes it a leading investment partner in the region. Foreign investment in Myanmar reached 8 billion US dollars last year, and more than half of it came from Singapore. The future remains bright as Myanmar and Singapore work to promote trade through a bilateral investment treaty. The investment that is paramount for our transition is investment in our human resources. It is also fundamental to our sustained development plan. One econ economist observed that all of Myanmar's critical economic indicators at this moment are either favorable or stable or moving in the right direction. But which is the right direction? The right direction for us is the one that will lead to an improvement in the quality of life of our people. Among the fundamental infrastructure requirements identified by our new administration in 2016 were roads and electrification, not only because these are among the basic requirements of potential investors, but because these are also essential to our investment in human resources. Better roads mean better access to health and education facilities, and lighting provides new opportunities for our people to achieve their potential. Over the last two years, nearly 3,000 miles of roads have been constructed or upgraded, with priority given to least developed regions such as Chin and Rakhine. And government spending on health and education has increased by 1.2 and 2 percent, respectively. Some of the steps we have taken, which may not seem significant to observers, make a great difference to the lives of our people. For example, the number of midwives appointed by our health ministry has increased from two digits to four. In our villages, the services of midwives are not limited to childbirth. They provide basic health care. By producing more midwives and by using modern technology to raise their capacity, we achieve a significant improvement in the health of our rural population. And our rural popula population makes up about 70% of our total population. On the education front, the recently published report of the Myanmar Living Conditions Survey 2017 the first of its kind, undertaken by the Ministry of Planning and Finance in conjunction with the UNDP and other international agencies, found that liter literacy has risen across generations. Generation gaps in literacy have closed at the national level, and the rise in the average literacy, literacy was predominantly driven by women. And school enrollment rates have been rising steadily. The survey covers population and demographic, demographics, energy and electricity, assets and household materials, water and san sanitation, technology, including mobile phone, computer and internet, education and labor. In its own words, the report documents some stark overtime changes in lighting, education, goods ownership and technology usage. But Progress still needs to be made in some parts of the country where outcomes are lagging. The Myanmar Living Conditions Report deals with measurables. There are also unmeasurables, which are not just indicators of present conditions, but also of future prospects. As the time has almost come for me to conclude the lecture, I will just mention one of the most important indicators. Perhaps I might even say the most important indicator, which is the potential of our young people. Over recent weeks, I have had the opportunity to meet informally with school children ranging from primary to upper secondary school level. Physically, they are not as well grown as they might be, as they should be reflecting the problem of malnutrition, an issue that the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Social Welfare are addressing as a prior, prior, priority. But how delightful they were, bright, polite, but not shy, 
eager to show off what they knew, but with an awareness that there was still much they did not know. Willing to learn, immensely teachable. What glittering prizes might such children not win for our country? Let us take a look. The first global challenge robotic competition held in Washington, D.C. in July 2017. 163 entrants from 157, 157 con com countries and the team of engineering students from Myanmar came out six, first among all the ASEAN countries. It was a... <laughs> thank you. It, it was a triumph of innovation and teamwork. It was an indication of our potential, of how we shall find the resources to overcome the challenges of our transition. The greatest strength of a democratic transition, the involvement of the people, is also its greatest challenge, to weld together the will and purpose of millions into a whole that allows the wonderful diversity of our country to shine through is a formidable undertaking. I believe that our people have the capacity to meet this challenge and to carry the transition to a successful, successful conclusion, which will be the starting point of a new, better era for our nation. And I believe that our ASEAN friends will be with us as we continue on our journey. Before I conclude, I would like to invite all our friends to join us in our journey. Our journey is not a simple journey, it's a venture. It's a venture into the unknown future, it's an adventure. It's an adventure in which we are all taking part. We have many challenges to face, many weaknesses that we must address, but we have confidence confidence in the ability of our people and the capacity of our people to grow into these challenges. We have mentioned among the challenges that we have to face, I mentioned earlier that uh, amendments to the Constitution was one of the goals of our government. And this is something that we, to, we, we need to mention here because the completion of a democratic transition must necessarily involve the completion of a truly democratic constitution. This we have not yet achieved, but we aim to achieve it through negotiation and through evolution. During my time in the legislature uh, from 2012 to 2015, we discussed amendments to the Constitution. We were, of course, a minority then. But we put forward our ideas, the, the parts of the Constitution which we believe would have to be amended if we are truly to be a democratic society. But we also made it quite clear that these changes we will bring, out, we will bring about through negotiation always keeping in mind that national reconciliation is one of our greatest needs. A country with 135 ethnic groups, how can we go forward without learning how to live with diverse ideas, diverse customs, diverse aspirations? To do that, we must learn to talk to one another, also to listen to one another. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, of, of talking to you today, and I hope that you have been listening. We have often found that listening requires much more than sitting in a room and, and, um, well, and, and letting the sound flow in. We would like you to listen with understanding, listen with empathy, listen by putting yourself in our place, not the place of the government, but in the place of our ordinary people, of the citizens on the streets of our towns, in the villages, in our villages, in the fields. If you listen with their ears and you try to see with their eyes, you will have a better idea 
what, of what the real challenges of our transition are. They're not just challenges that the world sees, but the challenges that each and every one of our people sees for himself or herself. I am confident that ASEAN, better than any other part of the world, will understand our needs because we have been through the same experiences of colonialism, of nation building, of trying to develop an undeveloped economy, of trying to educate an uneducated, an educated um, citizen, citizenship, citizenhood. I don't know what the proper word is. And we, are, we, are very, we have been one of the best educated countries in Southeast Asia, but now we are trying to rebuild again. We are trying to put our people back again where they were in the days when Myanmar was considered one of the fastest developing nations in Asia. But we're not sitting on old laurels. That will not do us any good. We want to move forward. And we think we have the capacity to move forward. Leapfrog is a word that is often used today, but I'm not always very happy with it because it seems to uh, imply that we follow the same obstacle course as others have done before us. Our obstacle course is different from that of others. So instead of leapfrogging, I think I would like to think of perhaps flying over the obstacles. That might be a better help, and that might be better able to take us quickly to our goal. The democratic transition actually has now been in place for 30 years. That's a long time. And I would like to see the time when we complete it come soon and come in a harmonious and tranquil manner with the help of our well-wishers from all over the world. Thank you. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, after that excellent lecture, Dorsu has agreed to take some questions uh, from the floor. Uh, perhaps, Heng Chi, you can start. Professor Chan Heng Chi. Uh, Your Excellency, Dorsu uh, San Chi, as a Singaporean and a member of the audience, first of all, allow me to welcome you warmly to Singapore again. I am Chan Heng Chi. I'm from the I'm chairman of the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities in the Singapore University of Technology and Design. My question for you is this. I've been listening and I've listened to your speech, which covered the wide range of the, you know, uh, suite through the different um, struggles, the different, you know, benchmarks in your um, uh, constitutional and democratic transition. You've touched on, you know, in this speech, quite a lot on ethnic armed conflict and also Rakhine and the economic problems. So my question for you is this. NLD and you have been in government for almost two years now. What has surprised you most in governance in this period? Well, I have to say, nothing has really surprised me. <laughs> well, after 30 years in, in, in uh, politics, I think you, you cease to be surprised by anything at all. But what has surprised me most? I, I, I'm being honest when I say that nothing really surprised me. We were prepared for what we would have to cope with. And we were well prepared. As I said, 30 years is a long time. But. Uh, what shall I say? What, shall I just say what struck me most rather than what surprised me most? Uh, was the fact that they would prepare little talking points from me whenever I had to meet a, a visitor. I thought, oh, this is very strange. I'm supposed to go with a little book and talk to, our, to my guest out of it. And that I found rather strange. But, <laughs> I, I have to confess that I don't use these books. <laughs> <laughs> but my staff still assiduously prepares them for me. Uh, 
Tommy. Uh, Your Excellency Do Su, uh, I want to begin by telling you that you have many admirers in Singapore. We, we admire your courage, your love of country, and your commitment to democracy. I think you've convinced us this afternoon to want to join your journey and adventure. I want to ask you <clears throat> two questions. You face many challenges, but I want to just ask your comment on two of them. The transition from military rule to democracy is yet incomplete. You said something in your lecture. Could you share with us a few more of your thoughts on how we can complete this journey? My second question is about the economy. As you know, Singapore is the second largest investor in Myanmar, and we want to do more. But our business people find your environment very challenging. I hope you will not be offended, and your minister will I not. I won't be offended. I hope but you will I not think be I'm the chair of our MIC I, might feel a little offended. I hope you will not be offended if I refer to the fact that in the UN's list of countries for ease of working, of ease of doing business, you currently rank 171 out of 190 countries. It's a rough indication of the many challenges our business people face. So could you please um, tell the peop good people in this audience what reforms you and your colleagues intend to introduce in the months and years ahead which will attract more investment from Singapore and more participation in your ambition to grow the economy, to build good jobs for your people. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to say how happy I am to see you again. I must tell the audience that uh, Mr. Ko and I were perky youngsters together in the United Nations Secretary <laughs> way, way, way back. <laughs> and he was the youngest uh, representative there, permanent representative there, and was a very good friend of somebody I used to refer to as my emergency aunt. <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy to see you again. Uh, the two questions. The first one, how do we complete the transition from military rule to democracy? Well, if you look at the Constitution, you will see that 25% of the seats in all the legislatures, meaning to say not just the national legislatures, but the regional and state legislatures, all of them, 25% are made up, 25% go to uh, representatives nominated by the military. So we can only contest 75% of the seats. That means, as I always say, that we, uh, we have only 75% of rights, but 100% of the responsibilities. That's how it goes. So we've got to change that. And, but we want, we've got to change that. And we have said that we want to change this. This is what's, what we, uh, we put this for our um, agenda forward officially during the last legislature when, when, we, when I was still there, that we wanted to change this. We must remove unelected representatives from the legislature, but we shall do that through negotiation and step by step, keeping in mind our need for national reconciliation. And there are other parts of the Constitution which are not democratic, and these also are the parts to do with the powers of the military. So all this will have to be discussed and negotiated and changed. But we want to do it, we, we want to do it in a, in a way that will not hurt our people. We've had enough unrest in Burma. We've had enough trouble in our country. Our people have suffered enough. We do not want to lead, we, 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 did, we do not want to encourage the kind of revolutions that, uh, that turn that country upside down. We will be patient, but we will be persistent. We will do it within the framework of the rule of law. With regard to um, the difficulty of doing business in Myanmar, as I said, the chairman of our, uh, of our Myanmar Investment Commission will be very, very offended. He's smiling, of course, but I'm sure he's not really very happy about it. And uh, I have to say that uh, 
And, and let, let me just say this. There's, there's been a change in, in leadership in the economic world in our country over the last couple of months. And we're speeding up the process. Uh, I think our chairman will promise you that any serious investor, any serious potential investor will be given all his attention and all his assistance. And also, uh, our rules and regulations have been changed to facilitate business. I know that it is not easy to go from uh, a new legislation immediately into, into its implementation very quickly, but we are doing our best. And I think, uh, uh, Udanto, how, how, how many rungs can we climb up the business ease ladder in a, a year, do you think? <laughs> from 171 to where shall we climb up to? <laughs> I can... I'll climb down, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to climb up. We'll climb down. But, uh, we can't be held responsible for the sins of the, the past administration. But uh, I can tell you, 171 is not something that we'd like to see. So we are working on it. The first thing we have done is that since the first of this month, we'll allow companies to register online and pay online. So that should ease. That's simply Singapore. <laughs> I'm not sure if they do that in Singapore, but we are going to pay online, allow registration online, and that's going to move uh, the ease of doing business in Myanmar by 10 digits or so. And we're going to have new laws. We already constituted new laws, which will make it easier for the investor. So please try me out, Singapore, and see if it's easier. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I think your KPI has just been publicly set by the <laughs> State Councillor. More questions, please. Perhaps from the centre block here, I will invite some questions. There's a hand there. Yes, please. Roger. Thank you very much. Yes, we can hear you. Anyway, my voice is loud enough. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. There is nobody here. Uh, perhaps you can identify yourself first for, for the benefit Sorry. of Your Excellency. DJ Rajan. Yes, Rajan, yes. I'm a retired civil servant. There is not very many people who are not moved by the suffering of the so called people, displaced people, Rohingyas. And it is not unfair, it's not, it is unfair to say that you yourself are not moved by it. But many of your critics, well-meaning though they are, they seem to suffer selective amnesia in not addressing graver similar situations elsewhere. Having, and also among those innocent people, extremists embedded in them who have perpetrated similar abuses on people of other faith. Now, my question is, Your Excellency, what is the time frame of your government in solving this very pressing issue, which is very important for economic development? Thank you. What is the time frame for oh, resolving? Which one? Do you know? Sorry, uh, Mr. Rajan, do you mean Rakhine or do you mean uh, the Panglong? Do you mean the, EA, the, the peace process? Or, or I'm not quite sure. Well, it's very difficult for us to put a time frame on it by ourselves unilaterally you know, because we have to work with Bangladesh in order to do that. So a time frame can be decided only by our two countries working together. We, the, the, uh, the IDPs have to be sent back by Bangladesh. The returnees have to be sent back by Bangladesh and we can only welcome them at the border. That is part of our agreement. So it's not for us alone to set a time frame. I think Bangladesh would also have to decide how quickly they want the process to be completed. We, we have been ready to receive them since, since uh, the 23rd of January in accordance with the MOU that was signed last November. Is that what you, you wanted to know? Thank you. Further questions? Perhaps I can take one from here. You had a gentleman here with his hand up. Yes. 
please identify yourself as well. My name is Su Ding. I'm the president of the Society of Myanmar Civil Engineers in Singapore. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is, uh, I'd like to know what is the biggest challenge in obstruction to implement the rule Could of law? Could you hold the microphone closer, please? Yeah. Yes. What is the biggest challenge in obstruction or implementation the rule of law in Myanmar? That's my first question. The second question is, what are the challenges in the way to attract more foreign investment in Myanmar industrial and infrastructure project? Thank you. Well, with regard to what's the biggest obstruction with regard to the establishment of rule of law, I think the biggest obstruction is really the perception of our people of rule of law. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I once met a group of law students who had come to study what was going on in, the, in, in, in our legislature. And I asked them, what do you think the law is for? Now, they were law students, but they couldn't answer that question for some time. They thought very hard. And then they said to me, to punish wrongdoers. I said, no, that's not how I see the law. As far as I'm concerned, the law is there to protect the harmony and stability of society. And this is a basic concept that we all need to grasp in our country. That's the biggest challenge. If all our people could understand that that's what the law is for. And by the way, I must explain that when we say rule of law in our own language, it sounds much better than it does in English, because we say the rule of just laws. There are laws that are unjust. There are laws that are bad. But we always say the rule of just laws. And if we could understand that just laws are there to bring harmony and stability and peace to our society, then everybody concerned, the, 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 the security forces, the people, uh, the government, everybody, the legislature, the judiciary, we can all work together to establish rule of law. So that's, that's our biggest challenge, for all of us to understand what rule of law is about. Some people think that rule of law is there to punish wrongdoers. Some people think that it's there to curtail their, their liberty. It is neither. So this is our biggest challenge. Now, I think your second question is more or less what was asked earlier by Mr. Koh, so I will not, I don't think I need answer it again, how to facilitate business, how to make it easier for investors to, to go down the ladder in Myanmar. Perhaps I can take another question from this side. Hmm. Sir? My name is Timba Montana, I'm a Myanmar national. Uh, I'm associate fellow at the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Your Excellency, I think the civil service is very important in the transition. And I think in the past, we used to joke that there's neither civil nor gift service. How do you, as I know that there have been reforms going on, but how I think it would make, take a long time for our civil service to become a top notch like in Singapore. And I hope that you will press on that further. Thank you. Well, we're trying very hard. We know that there's a lot that we need to do to make our civil service civil and for serviceable. And also, uh, we want a civil service that is people friendly and efficient. And efficient. Now, the problem is that our education system was really not up to standard over the last 30 or 40 years, which means that we've lost about two generations. Before we contested the elections in 2015, I made a, a very simple calculation and I came to the conclusion that our best educated people would have retired from the civil service by the time our government came into office. And this is exactly what had happened. So this is a big challenge. But on the other hand, I find that there's a, our people have an ability to learn quickly and to adapt to new situations. We still have those who are clinging on to old values and old ways and uh, teaching them to, uh, to behave differently, to think differently is not easy. But we're doing it all the time. We're trying, and Singapore has been helping us in this. So the Singapore has been hel helping us in our venture to raise the capacity of our civil servants and other friends as, as well, other countries international agencies have been helping us. But as I said earlier, our hope is in our young. 
our young are quick to learn and they want to progress. They do not want to be left behind by the rest of the world. And I do want to take the opportunity to thank all the civil servants who have worked so well for us since we came into office. It has not been easy. They've had the, there have been some bad ones, and, but the good ones have tried to make up for that. And uh, I myself cannot complain of the staff of my Ministry for Foreign Affairs. So you can take heart from that. Perhaps I take another question. Yes, from here, from this side. Your Excellency, Dosu, thank you very much for the lecture. I'm Ryan, a student from Unior know, Junior College. Now, in spite of all the great achievements that the NLD has uh, achieved in this past few years, many critics still say that there is one power that you cannot control, and that is the military. And you yourself have alluded to the considerable influence that the military continues to wield to this day. So in, with that in mind, how likely do you think another military coup is? Well, I, I, actually, you know, this is a question that you should ask the army rather than ask me. I would have thought that they would be in a better position to answer such a question. But let's put it this way. I don't worry unduly about such matters. Everything is a possibility in political life, as you know. But I think we have to be pragmatic, and we, I, the, our relationship with the army, it's not that bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you shouldn't think that it's as bad as all that. Don't forget that we have three members of the cabinet who are, in fact, uh, military men, generals. And they're all rather sweet, the three of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very charming reply. <laughs> Perhaps I can take a question from this side. <laughs> Over there. Well, I, I'm lucky to get this chance. Um, my name is Bob Zhen. Uh, I'm a lawyer working in, in Yangon. Let me report to you, Your Excellency and uh, Seiya Wu Daotong. Last Saturday, I registered a company. I paid 215,000 Myanmar jet. On Sunday, one day after, I received the certificate of incorporation. Even during weekend, Daikai is was working. I, I was very impressed. So this also share with all the participants here. Thank you. <laughs> it took me past five years to complete uh, about 100 companies. And now under the new company's law, every company required to re-register. I believe if like, I put all my people there to do, in two weeks, everything can be done. So I appreciate that a lot. All right, I think there is one question uh, all the investors, all the people here will be interested in. Another election will come, uh, 2020, which is two more years. And what will be your uh, prediction on the result? <laughs> Oh, I'm not an astrologer, but I think, I think if you want this business uh, efficiency to continue, you'd better root for us. <laughs> Perhaps we take another question further back there. I think there was a hand up. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Mandy, and I'm from CHIJ St. Nicholas Girls School. So recognizing the repatriation of uh, Rakhine um, refugees has already begun, um, there's so, some social stigma against the in, uh, internally displaced people in the Rakhine state. So in this case, how does Her Excellency seek to reintegrate them into society? Specifically, could they be used to boost foreign investment and economic development in Myanmar? I don't think stigma is a word. I think it's prejudices and misunderstandings. These will have to be removed. But we all want to work together to make the Rakhine a prosperous and peaceful region. You know, it's one of the most beautiful regions in the whole country. Very few people have been to Rakhine, and the foreigners who've been there have often told me that the beaches there are the most wonderful they've ever come across in the whole wide world. And there's great potential there. You are right. I think we should bring them together through development, through the kind of programs that will help them to prosper together. 
And I'm glad that you've asked this question because you are young. And it is young people who can uh, overcome the prejudices that have divided their parents, their forefathers. So I would like to invite you to take part in our adventures to bring together the peoples of the Rakhine. There are many different communities in the Rakhine. I think uh, I, should, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to tell you that they're not just the Muslims and the Rakhines, as most people think. There are Hindus there, there are Mro, there are Te, there are Daine. These are small ethnic groups. And I particularly would like you to take an interest in the small ethnic groups, because some of them are disappearing very quickly. They are down to, the, to four figures. They live in their own traditional ways. Um, they are very peaceful. They are very, very uh, people who are content with very little. But we must do everything we can to help them to preserve their culture, their traditions, and to help them to prosper and to join the rest of the country in our development plans. Would you take another two questions, please? Yes. Uh, Dosu has agreed to take two more questions. Perhaps the young lady there. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nin Izli. I'm an ASEAN scholar from Yama, uh, from Yuno Junior College. Uh, after studying here for about four years, I realized that there are a lot of areas in which our education system can improve. And I think that beyond like improving the literacy, literacy rate, I feel like uh, there should be some subjects that like we should introduce new subjects to instill critical thinking in our students and that's also like partly how you can uh, achieve other goals like peace and st stability because you can uh, like change people's mindsets so my question is that in your list of priorities uh, where does the educational reforms rank and how can youths like us like uh, who haven't graduated like but can, can we, how can we take small little steps so that we can contribute as our country fly over the obstacles? <laughs> <laughs> well, where, where, where does educational reform rank? Very, very high. I said earlier that our real investment is in our people, and that means health and education. And also, when I, when I was going around the country, everywhere I went, I would ask the people what are your greatest needs. And I was struck by the fact that, the first, of course, we're very practical. Down, our people are very down to earth. First of all, water in the places where there was not enough portable water. Secondly, roads. Thirdly, electrification. And fourth, always education before health. They thought that education was much more important than health because they thought that education was a way to ensure their children's future. So educational reform is very much a top priority. It's not just thinking our, te uh, teaching our children how to think or to catch, catch up technologically with the rest of the world. It's also to create a balanced society. One of the issues that uh, I find very, very challenging is that of making sure that our boys do as well as our girls. <laughs> now, no, I'm very serious about that, and I'm. I am surprised that other countries which are facing the same problem of girls doing considerably better than the boys are not worried. I'm worried because I, I don't want our, 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 our boys to be uh, dropouts sitting in tea shops and being fed by the women. And that would not be a good idea at all. <laughs> so I, I want to readjust our education system in such a way that boys and girls will have an equal opportunity to, uh, to display their talents and to realize the potential. The talents of boys are not the same as that of girls. I mean, there's, there's no denying it. We may talk about equality, but equality doesn't mean absolutely exactly the same. So, uh, and uh, for example, I want to introduce certain subjects into our curriculum which will make us realize that boys have special talents. For example, art. Art, music, the, girl, the boys do very well. They don't do so well in those subjects where you have to learn everything up by road. And even when it comes to something like poetry, I think the men here will agree with me. The boys like to um, memorize the poems that mean something to them. The girls memorize the poems that will help them to pass the exams. Do you think that's 
<laughs> you don't think so? <laughs> No, isn't that nice? All the men are championing the women, <laughs> and vice versa. So this is how it should work. But we, we really have to make sure that we improve our education system very quickly. And one of the things I was discussing earlier with your education minister was this, vocational training and also language skills. Uh, when we talked about our civil service earlier, one of our big weaknesses now that is the fact that very few of our civil servants have adequate uh, language skills, meaning to say their English is not up to the mark. So we want to improve their language skills to enable them to engage with the rest of the world. And we want to concentrate on vocational training because that is another area of which I'm very hopeful and very proud in our country is that our people are taking to vocational education in a way in which some Asian countries are not. I think in many Asian countries, the perception still is that vocational training is second-class education. And I don't want that in our country. And I'm very happy because vocational training is, has taken off in Myanmar. People understand its value, and we are making a special effort to channel our young people into the vocational training school. And of course, we must think, teach everybody to think and think in the right way. But that's not just for me or even just for the Ministry of Education, but for all our people. We, we all learn together. Education is a process, and it's an inclusive process. Perhaps time for final question, final question here. Uh, good afternoon, Your Excellency. I'm very glad you bring up the... Can you identify yourself? Sorry. Yes. I'm, uh, my name is Chin Hui. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Trafigura. Uh, we are uh, one of the largest uh, multinational companies investing in Myanmar. We have invested hundreds of millions, have hundreds of uh, employees in Myanmar. I'm very glad you may bring up the last point because we have used VTTI students, which is a joint venture between the Singapore and Myanmar uh, Vocational Institute, ITE, uh, uh, venture. We find the students are very hardworking and they are very eager to learn. So I'm very happy to hear as a big foreign investor in your country, they are, they are taking the right steps. And if I also may address an additional point to the chairman of the investment board, that while you climb up the ladder, please also remember the existing investor, people like ourselves who has invested hundreds of millions, who have uh, outstanding deals yet to be approved. So if you could look at the <laughs> backlogs of investments. Backlog. All right, yes. without him, please move the backlog. Yes. <laughs> thank you, man. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I think this afternoon we've had a most interesting uh, 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 lecture and uh, question and answer session with uh, Her Excellency Dong San Suu Kyi. The afternoon session has uh, lived up to our expectations, I think, of all of us. And uh, Dosu has addressed difficult and challenging questions, not ducked any of them, and done so in a way which is uh, typical of Dosu, energetic, empathetic, elegant, erudite, and inspiring. Shall we say thank you to Dosu? Thank you, esteemed today councillor Dosu. Thank you, DPNTO. Can You're I just excited? say thank you because this, this whole occasion has been much more fun than I thought it would be. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much to all of you. Once again, thank you to the esteemed State Councillor and to DPNTO. Ladies and gentlemen, as a token of our appreciation, Professor Wang Gangwu, Chairman of the ICS Board of Trustees, and Mr. Choi Xing Kwok, Director of the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute, will now present State Councillor Dawn San Suu Kyi with a pottery piece crafted by one of Singapore's foremost potters, Mr. Chua Su Kim. Entitled Sky, Forest, Greenland, the colors on the pottery piece represent the aspiration for a clean and green planet.
to commemorate this special occasion, may I respectfully invite Amesu, DPMTO, Professor Wang, and Mr. Choi to pose for a photo. Thank you, Amesu. Thank you, DPM. Thank you, Prof. Wang. And thank you, Mr. Choi. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the 43rd Singapore Lecture. Please remain in your seats while our distinguished speaker and guests take their leave.